again to our monthly meeting uh, for African Connect. So as I always say, I am Enimoa and I am part of the African Connect Society here in Calgary. So what we basically want to do is to bridge the gap between immigrants and newly landed immigrants and the economic world. So usually when immigrants come, the first challenges when they want to find jobs and so what we aim to do is to bridge that gap so that they can smoothly move from being a newcomer or an immigrant into the Canadian economic space. So today we have with us Mr. Aguadu who is a safety professional. So he will give us a little bit about his journey when he came to uh, Canada and some of the challenges that he experienced and how he overcame it, some strategies and tips. And because he's also a safety professional, he's going to tell us more about how to keep safe during this period. I hope you are doing what you are being asked to do. We are keeping safe. We are washing our hands. We are wearing our nose masks and we are keeping our social distancing. Please do well to keep safe. We need you alive. If you're in Canada, we need you alive to help the economy grow. Wherever you are, we need you alive to help the economy and the world. So please be safe. So you, always, you will also share with us some tips and strategies as the economy is opening up and we need to go out there to work. So please stay tuned. If you have any questions, please send the questions. If you're on Facebook, put the questions in the comment section. And if you are in our Zoom meeting, please put it in the chat and we'll read your questions and we'll get your questions answered. Thank you very, very much. And we are so honored that you, you are able to join us this month as well. So Mr. Guado, the floor is yours now. Thank you very much for honoring our invitation. And we are really um, honored to have you today. Thank you. I don't think we can hear you. We can't hear you. Can you hear us? I don't think I can hear you. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. All okay, right, thank you. Um, before I start, I would like to say that immigration is really an expensive um, venture because one, it could cost you money, two, it will cost you relationships, and three, it will cost you your career. So um, for me, you could sacrifice either any of the three for you to immigrate, or you can choose to balance all three. For me, what was so important was for me to be able to balance all three. Um, prior to coming to Canada, I have studied two years in the Netherlands, and I've been to Japan for six months for a course. And I must say that what I saw, there were good stories and there were not too good stories. So I, it never crossed my mind to think of immigration. But then when I found myself in a situation where I needed to immigrate, then I started thinking of what would best work for me, be it relationship, career, or money. Now, because of the stories that I've heard about immigration, it wasn't a situation for me to actually move out of Ghana. So when the opportunity came, I was actually pushed to think about this because my wife was in Canada and um, she loved it in Canada. So I was forced to kind of think of coming to Canada too. Now, I would say broadly, there are two categories of people who want to immigrate. One, those who want to willingly immigrate, and two, those who are reluctant to immigrate. So it depends on which category you find yourself. If you find yourself in the area of willingness, that is good for you. But then if you are reluctant, that is really a big challenge. So for me, I was in the second category of being reluctant to come to Canada because of the stories and then the experiences I had when I was in Holland studying. Um, it took me two and a half years to about three years to actually take a decision to migrate. So it, would, it tells you how difficult it was for me 
to think about migrating. Um, within this period, what I was thinking was what really was going to work for me, whether I was going to fall in the good story category or not too good story category. And I didn't want to fall into the not too good category because I felt I was okay back home in Ghana. So what I decided to do was to design a roadmap. Well, what I refer to a roadmap is a plan because I didn't want to come to Canada and find myself in a situation that I don't want to and regret. So as a naturally um, calculated person, I decided to have a plan that would either keep me in Canada for good or I will leave Canada if it doesn't work for me. So what I did was that within the two and a half years to three years, I saved up enough money and I developed a strategy. So the first strategy was medium term. If I come to Canada and it does not work for me within six months, I'll go back to Ghana. That was the, the short term plan. The medium term plan was after one year, if it doesn't work for me, what would I do? And then the long term was I would just leave and survive whatever the situation was. But knowing myself very well, I knew very well that I would not leave it to chance. I would have to change how this, the story is going to be. So because I was working, I had an accumulated leave for two and a half to three years. That gave me about 300 days of leave. So what it means was that if I come to Canada and within, after spending my, my leave period and it doesn't work, I will easily go back to Ghana and continue where I left off. The second one was if after six months, I don't think I will survive, then I will write to my employers back home in Ghana and ask them to grant me one year work leave without pay. So then if it doesn't work within the one year, I will then decide whether to stay in Canada for good. So the immigration process itself wasn't so difficult. It took within three months to six months for me to get to Canada. So when I came to Canada, it was Christmas. It was really nice. I mean, it's Christmas time, it was, it was shopping here and there. It was, it was a nice experience. I really enjoyed it. But then because I had a plan, I quickly started implementing plan one, which was the short term. So we did a lot of research into where I could um, improve my career and then that will help me get a job as soon as I'm possible. So during Christmas, though I was having, enjoying the Christmas, I was also thinking about what to do within the shortest possible time. So I, within that short period after Christmas, I had applied to about 50 jobs, about just in a matter of two weeks, because I really needed something that would stabilize me as soon as possible. But there was no response, there was nothing. I, there were even people were suggesting that, oh, you can, because I have a master's degree, so I was applying with a master's degree, and somebody told me, look, you know what? Apply with your junior high um, diploma. That would show that you're not overqualified. And, and so there were so many stories. Some were discouraging, others were encouraging. And I, I, I was like, it wasn't really a good decision to, to, to come to Canada because um, though I had a plan, the stories were kind of a bit confusing. So um, I, I was like, it was, it was kind of like, uh, what is really going to happen? Because though I had a plan, sometimes you get swayed off the plan and then you are thinking of something else because you want to get a job, you want to get into the system, you want to do something. So from the beginning, I mentioned that Migrating can cost you relationships, it can cost you money, it can cost you your career. So for me, I was thinking of balancing all three. So I was making sure that the fact that I'm here does not really impact the way I related to my wife because it's really important. And then I didn't want to also spend every money that I have 
And then after some time, I found myself wanting. So after a lot of research, what we, my wife and myself, we decided to do was for me to start a course. And of course, it was expensive. So I started a course and looking for a job. And then we are also spiritually um, inclined people. So we were praying and asking God for a breakthrough because I think that the spiritual aspect is really important because when you migrate, like it's, you have what we call the, um, the, the culture shock because there are things that people do here that you are not used to. So um, we were praying and, 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 and hoping that something will, will, will come through. And then I had a call from the company and then I had an interview. And um, I, because it appeared to me that plan one was working. So what I decided to do was to prepare as much as I can for the interview. I read all the materials. I did all the research that I could do. So I went for the interview and I performed to the best of my capability. I didn't hear back from the company. So I asked myself, well, after applying for about 300 jobs, I had one uh, interview and I had no response from them. So the question is, what happens next? So I decided to review how their, um, the, the interview went. So I asked around and I was told that probably because I seated um, how much I wanted to take for an hour. So uh, maybe I came across as being too expensive. So that was why I, I, I couldn't get a job. So then, so I kept applying. And then you, you talk to people and people say, I, how many applications have you written so far? I said, oh, maybe 400. Say, sure. By now, you should be writing about 600 or maybe to 1,000 applications. So I'm like, <laughs> in some of the jobs, I didn't even remember even what I put in my, in my resume because um, it, there were so many applications and it, it was it kind of like uh, it, it, mentally you, you, you get really depressed. You find yourself in a very difficult situation, especially if you are somebody who is um, looking in terms of um, advancing your career. So. So it, it, was, it was kind of like, you ask yourself a lot of questions. You ask yourself whether you took the right decision, whether you, you, you did the right thing, why did you leave your job? Mind you, in my situation, I still had my job. I was still taking my salary anyway, but still I, I, I felt really uncomfortable. So I, you, you, people say, oh, you know what? You have to take survivor job. Like you have to do many jobs to survive. And I'm like, why did I go to school for years and then, and then start doing minor jobs? Then probably maybe I should just have forgotten about education and then started with the many jobs. But I, I, as I mentioned, I was thinking of balancing all, all three things, money, career, and relationships. So I, I didn't want to sacrifice my career because I'm in Canada and I didn't want to sacrifice any other thing. So, um, I continue with it. The courses were expensive. I, I spent um, close to about $7,000 to be able to get um, 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 certificates. So when I got a certificate, we continued praying and hoping that something would come through. And then it was getting to the six months. Then I had a call for a job. So um, I did my research again, did all that I, I, I could do, and I made sure that for this one, I wouldn't let it pass because I'd even lost count of the number of applications that I put through. So fortunately for me, when I went for the interview, I did the rest and everything that I, 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 I could do, and I got a job. So I was happy. The good thing was that the pay was good, it was like um, God had come through for us. But then the real challenge for me is before I migrated was the road plan or the road map that I had before um, coming to Canada. That is very, very important to me because if you come into a system and you have no plan, you will end up 
sacrificing things that you leave to regret. So if you ask me what um, like really worked for me, I would say no matter which category you find yourself, whether, be, whether it's in the category of somebody who is reluctant to migrate or somebody who is willing to migrate, it is important for you to have a roadmap. What exactly do you want for yourself? What will work for you? What will work for your career? What will work for your relationships? Because it's really important. Other than that, you end up sacrificing either your relationship, either your, your, your money or your career. What works for you? And it, for me, people say, oh, you, you didn't have so much hassle when you came to Canada. Yes, it's true. But the point is that it took me three years to take a decision to migrate. And the stress in terms of putting a plan together is just unbearable. Maybe somebody wants to migrate, that person who wants to come to Canada and then um, have a plan when they come to Canada. I would say if you, you want to enjoy migrating to whichever country, I would say you need to have a plan before you start. Have a solid plan. And when you come in, there are going to be a lot of stories. People will tell you the good ones, they will tell you the bad ones. People will tell you, look, you can start with this, and as time goes on, you change. It's true, it could work that whilst you are in here, it, it could change. But the other aspect is that probably you might not change, and then you continue to do what you want to do. But the point is that what, what exactly do you want for yourself? If it's your career that matters most for you, you need to ask yourself a lot of questions, how you are going to improve your career when you come here. So when I, when I got a job, I, I tried to, to get qualified as a professional because um, as I said, for me, three things are important to me and that was, that were my guidepost. So I asked myself, how am I going to progress in this career? And um, for, I, I'm a safety professional, so um, there, you, you, you can become a um, Canadian registered safety professional if you, um, you want to progress in that area. So, but, it, but then it's, I, I applied and I was told that because I don't have enough Canadian experience, um, I wasn't qualified to, to, to get um, certified as a professional. So what, what I asked myself was, how do I get in there to get um, certified as a professional? So I, I spoke with my boss and then um, they told me, um, you need about a minimum of three years work experience like a whole lot, but I was saying that I had a master's degree. They said, yeah, you have a master's degree, but you've not worked enough in Canada, and a whole lot of um, issues. So, so I did my, my research again, and I noticed that what I have to do was to get a certificate. So from the beginning, my employers agreed to pay for um, the courses. The courses were expensive, but I needed to do about 13 of them, and each, each one cost about 600 to $700. So um, I took the first one. Normally you pay and then you get reimbursed by your employer. I took the first one and just around that time, the economy went into recession. So when the economy went into recession, the, my employer said, you know what? We are cutting costs, so we are not going to sponsor your, your courses again. So you, you have to, um, you're on your own. Like in the nutshell, that was the situation. So I thought of myself. One, it's either I wait for the economy to turn around, then my employers will agree to continue to sponsor me. Two, I can forget about it. Or three, I have to pay myself. So, and then back to my plan, it was like for me to make sure that I get somewhere because I, I cherish my career. I, I don't want to stop anywhere because my career was important to me as well as any other thing in terms of the three things that will cost you when you migrate to Canada. So I decided to pay for the course myself. So I took the course one after the other and finally I got a certificate, a postgraduate certificate in health and safety and then I applied um, 
for certification as a, as a professional. So I, when I prepared my application, I gave it to my boss because even with that, your employers would have to certify that you are competent um, to be in the profession and then you've, you've, you've done over 75% of full work to be able to um, sit for the exams. So according to my manager, they did all that they have to do in terms of um, providing the, my competency, uh, verifying my competency skills. So they sent in the verification. And for some reason, I got a response from the certification body that um, my verification documents were not signed by my boss. I'm like, how is that possible? So I, I went to my boss and then I asked, and my boss told me um, she did all that she could do, but then uh, why, how come um, the, my, my uh, competency verification was not signed? So what it means is that it's going to take me another one year um, to be able to go through the exams. It was um, a very painful thing for me because I felt that um, I had worked to some extent and I feel that it's either for some reason, um, how can you forget, I ask myself, how can you forget to sign a document when you knew very well that that is the most important aspect of the document? But it happened to me and um, there, were, there were other things that happened that I, I, I don't really want to kind of like categorize those um, um, things because I, Sometimes you feel like they don't like you because of the color of your skin, but uh, that is that is that is the situation. Because how can you send in somebody's competency verification and forget to sign? So, but I I kind of felt like well, my, I I have that good relation with my boss, so it's it's not about that. But the thing is that you 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 feel there's something wrong. But then you can't even point a finger at it. So I said, well, if I've been able to survive the winter in Canada, I mean, <laughs> then nothing is going to stop me from actually getting my, my certification. So I said, if it's one year, I'll wait. Mind you, I was still kind of like guided by my, 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 my strategy. So um, it, it came and then after a year, I have to apply again. And this time around, the certification got through. So um, they, they, they passed me to be able to write the exams. So I'm, I'm pretty sure in the office, like people were thinking that, let's see if this guy will pass the exams because the exams mostly, it's upon maybe the second or third attempt before most people get their certification. So um, I guess that was also a challenge that look, you, you've come a long way, taking three years to decide to migrate, nothing should, should be able to stop you from getting to where you want to go. So it, it was time for me to write exams and um, I needed materials to study and others were attending classes and, and a whole lot of uh, uh, preparations went into that. But I told myself that, look, I'm not going to attend any class. I will get the materials, read them, and test myself and pass that exams. Um, I did all that I, I could do in terms of preparations, and um, I took the exams. So I, I, the day of the exams, I, I went in to, to, to write the exams, and uh, uh, it's, it's uh, computer-based, so no calculators. You just have a plain sheet of paper. And a, and a pen for you to be able to pass or to write the exams. It's the exams, it's about 210 questions and you have 210 minutes. So what it means is that for each question, you have one minute. Yes. So I took the exams and then exactly a year today, I actually got certified as a professional um, in Canada. So um it, it's been kind of like an exciting trip 
At the same time, it's been challenging, but I would say that <clears throat> if you decide to migrate or come to whichever country that you want to go to, I would ask you to have a plan in place. Think thoroughly what exactly you want to do. Why do you want to migrate? Is it really the option for you? Mind you, there are good and better stories than mine, and there are worse stories than mine. The question that you need to ask yourself is, why do you want to come across to another country? It's not going to be a free ride. It's going to be difficult. But I want to say that with this African Connect thing, when I came in, I didn't have any network um, to, to kind of like give me with the guidelines or the opportunity to talk to people who've had uh, maybe success stories here and there and the challenges that they went through and how they survived. This network actually would provide the opportunity for people to really um, share in people's experience on how they were able to migrate to Canada successfully or any other country successfully. It is very important for the networking because I, I noticed that most of the times, even for you to be able to get the right information, you need a proper network. When I came in, there were so many stories, like people tell you, look, it will take you 15 years to get into your profession. You may not even be able to pro uh, practice your profession. And these stories, when they come, they are so depressing. Sometimes it affects me to the extent that sometimes I even get angry with my wife for no reason, because I felt she was a person who came to Canada and I was forced to migrate here. So she's a source of my kind of like, um, stress. But the truth of the matter is that because of the stories you were hearing, people telling you all the bad things that you don't want to hear, and then few people tell you the good stories. So for you to be able to balance the act, it's always good to have the right information. Do all the research that you can, you can do. Like this African Connect thing, I, for me, I think that it's really a good thing because it provides you with a platform to be able to have the right information, do the right assessment on whether you are doing the right thing or not. And it also kind of provides that support system for you. Even if I'm not saying that if, if you have a plan, it will necessarily work when you come to wherever uh, place you are going to. But what it does is that it helps you get adequate and realistic information. Because if you're going somewhere and you don't really know what you're going to meet, it's a different thing altogether. But then if you have that support network, it helps you um, stand on your feet when you, you get to situations that is difficult for you, you are able to share in people's experience that would help you understand that no matter what, Others in there have survived. I can also survive. So um, I would like to um, maybe end here in terms of my short uh, but kind of like convoluted story on how I was able to come to Canada and get a job that I wanted to do and enjoy doing that work. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Aguado, for sharing your journey. You're going to give us some tips because you're a safety professional. The economies are opening up. People will be watching from Ghana and other African countries. Um, some people have thrown caution to wind. I've heard people say, oh, do you still believe COVID is real? Even here in Canada, I've met people and they want to shake me. And I say social distance and they're like, oh, do you think this thing is real? There's a lot of theories going around. So probably you'll share some of what you know from a safety uh, perspective and you also tell us how to keep safe because we want to keep safe and stay alive. But then I have um, some questions for you based on your journey. So uh, someone wants to know, 
uh, did you have any connection to the job that you got? Or it was just through applying, 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 and then you went for the interview. And if that was how you found it, what would be your number one tip that you would share in an interview to get a job? Because you first had an interview that nothing came back and you went back to the table. So what was that one thing that you changed that made the, uh, the, you get a job on the second try? So it's like a two in one question. Was there any connection or network networking that got you into the door? And what, what did you change around in your interviewing skill that landed you that job? All right, um, um, thank you. The first one, there was no connection. The other one was the resume preparation. I, I noticed that um, the Canada had a way of presenting your resume. It's very important. So after applying for jobs for a while, after the first um, field interview, um, I was trying to look into how best I can improve my situation. So somebody um, connected me to a group that helped me to kind of like reorganize and understand how best to um, reshape my resume. You no, know, when when you talk to people without any experience, what they tell you is that you, you put things in your resume for it to look good. But then when I had that interaction with um, that group, what they told me was that your resume is supposed to show some level of re uh, relevance to the job that you are applying to. So when I had the opportunity, I changed my resume. So they asked me to take a lot of um, information off my resume, though they were important, but they were not so relevant to the job because um, according to the information that I had, um, things are changing. So employers don't, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> employers don't have, <coughs> sorry, employers don't have time to read through voluminous um, um, resumes. So what you have to do is that you have to take out all the irrelevant materials in your, in your resume. One, like let's say for instance, people talk about their marriage status, people talk of um, uh, a lot of things that are not necessary. Their religion. Um, references uh, you are provided upon request. That is obvious, they will require references. If the job advert says that include your references, you include them. If it doesn't say anything at all, you don't say anything. If they need your reference, they will ask you um, to provide those. And when I started applying, my resume was about, I think four pages long. But after I did the reorganization, it was just only two pages. So um, when I went for the in interview or the preparation towards the interview, the first one was to read about the company. You see, they, they want to know whether you researched into the company um, to know um, whether you really want to work with the company. So you need to have a bit of information about the company because they're going to ask you certain things or what do you know about the company. The other one is to, depends, if you're going for, let's say, an in-person interview, your dressing is very important. I never thought it was so important, but then when I came here, I noticed that it's also important. You need to address appropriately for the interview. If, let's say for instance, you kind of like going for a corporate position and then you show up dressed casually, they will think that you are not serious. So it's, it's important to also understand um, the dress culture of the company that you're going to work with. And then you also need to be there on time because I, <coughs> I went there 30 minutes before time and it allowed me to, to relax before getting in there. I was able to organize my thoughts before the interview. If you go there too early, well, what I read was that you might, you might think you are too desperate. So you need to be there at the right time. So I, just about maybe 30 minutes or maybe 45 minutes before time so that you, if there are any processes that you need to go through, you go through before the real interview. And then also, when um, you, you, you go for the interview, you should be able to show, um, one, how you'll be able to help the company achieve their mandate. So if you've not read about a company, then you don't even know the mandate that the company or the vision that the company has. So you should be able to, in the interview, tell them your story, 
but then your story should be relevant to what they are looking out for. So if I talk of the story, I'm talking about your work experience. What are some of the challenges that you solved in your previous job that you can solve going forward with them? And then also, you should also engage the people that are interviewing you because normally when we go for interviews and then they ask us um, any questions, we tell them we don't have any questions. You should ask them certain questions. Um, I, would, I wouldn't talk about salaries unless they ask me to talk about salary because of the first interview that I had. So I wouldn't talk about that. I would talk more about, let's say for instance, what are the prospects in terms of growth in the company? These are some of the relevant, you should ask relevant questions. And then also you should be able to um, explain why you are the best person for the job because it's really important. You should also know that um, there are equally good people that have been shortlisted for the, for the interview. But the fact that you are attending the interview should tell you that you are also in a pole position to get a job, but then you need to tell them why you are the best among the people who have been shortlisted. Thank you. Thank you. So one last question that I have here. What would you say would have mentorship helped you if you had got mentors? So, and if, you, if mentorship would have helped you, what mentors would you have wanted? Mentors that are from the same background, like our Africans, or mentors that are white or in the mainstream. So what is your take on mentorship? Because I think you did mention that there was nothing, like there was no mentorship there. So would you have wanted mentorship and what kind of mentor would you have wanted? Um, um, yes, I, the, the mentorship is really important because you see, um, sometimes in our careers, probably maybe you want to change course. So you need somebody who is there to be able to help you um, understand what it might cost you if you decide to change um, directions. Or if you want to continue in a path that you are in, then you need somebody that will say, you are, well, it's, you need that encouragement. So you need that mentor to help you. It, you need to, because you see, the point is that what we do back home and what they do um, in Canada are two different things. So you need that bridging opportunity. So for you to be able to, because the point is that mostly when you are really skilled and then you are coming, what you need to do is that your skills are applicable here, but then how to reorganize your skills to be able to fit the situation in here is really critical. Because if you might have the skill already, but then how to reorganize it to meet the demands in this system, it, it's really important. So for me, I wouldn't mind if the mentor is white or black or whatever. What is important is what that person can be able to give me that will help me um succeed okay thank you very much for answering the questions i think there's other questions that we have today so probably we'll just zoom into you talking to us about some safety uh, precautions uh, that we need to take and also maybe address some of the myths and theories surrounding COVID 19 because i've had so many people tell me do you know somebody who has coronavirus do you know somebody who knows somebody who has who has coronavirus this thing that exists so probably talk a little bit about that and and talk to us about precaution and people also say oh because i am a religious person uh my religion will save me so i don't need to wear anything so probably talk around that because i you mentioned that you're a religious person as well yeah um thank you for that i would like to start from the really the um, the religious aspect of you know the bible says that lack of knowledge my people perish so in as much as we are religious people we need to still go by the guidelines that are in place because in the bible and uh, people were sick they were asked to wash it in, in 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 rivers and they got healed so it's not about being spiritual so you don't follow what you are supposed to um follow so that does not really cut it because you are spiritual and um, i would say that there are a lot of information out there which respects you um, um co uh, coronavirus and what have you I would say one, the source of information you are getting is really important. You have to verify 
how true that information is and what source is it coming from. There are so many, you know, started from um, that it was coming from 5G and, and whatnot. I, it, 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 it's, it's not been improving. So please make sure that you are getting the information from the right sources, reliable sources. Like you have your local health authorities, you have your local information ministries, and you have your local, those are places that you can get reliable information from. So please double check the source of the information that you are having and don't necessarily believe everything that you are, you are getting on social media. What you have to do is try as much as possible to go the extra step to verify the source of the information and how to that is. For instance, what I normally do is that if there is any information, what I go is I go to Google, I Google it, and then it tells you whether it's true or not. Like, it, it's easy in this world of um, social media, you can easily find out if it's true or not. You can verify from um, reliable news sources like B BBC, CNN, you know, there are so many areas that you can verify whether an information is true or not. With respect to um, the coronavirus, you see what is we need to understand is that we don't really have a full understanding of how this um, virus is behaving. So what I would say is that you are responsible for your own safety, understand your risk factor. If I say your risk factor is, do you have any underlying condition? Do you have a situation that will put you in a, in, a, in a high risk category. Like let's say for instance, if you have to necessarily go to work, what it means is that your risk factor is really high. So I would say that you are responsible for your safety. So you have to make sure that you take all the precautions to ensure that you are safe. The hygiene protocol is really important. You have to wash your hands as often as you can and um, limit the use of sanitizers. The reason being that Sanitizers are not as effective as washing of your hands with soap for at least 20 seconds under running water. Now, what you also need to understand is that sanitizers that we use is supposed to have at least 60% alcohol as the base. So if you are using sanitizers that, are, that have um, less than 60% alcohol, you know that you are not being protected at all. And then also, if you use sanitizers for a very long time or use them too much, you are likely to even suffer bends. So I would advise, I would suggest that you use more of washing of your hands with soap and, and, and running water. And also, if you use sanitizers, stay away from fire. Because if you know that um, sanitizer contains alcohol and alcohol is, can easily catch fire. So make sure that your hands are dry before um, you get closer to fire. And then also use the max. It's really important. You see, the, the, the max actually cuts the, the, the rate at which you, you, you the, the level of you getting, uh, getting the disease. So please, as much as you can, use, use, use the face max. And then physical distance is really important. The reason why we have been asked to um, physical distance is because um, when somebody has the virus and the person is talking or the person is singing, the person puts a lot of um, droplets into the air. So the closer you are to the person, the likelihood that that droplet will get into your nostrils or it will get into your eyes or it will get into your mouth and that will be a source of contamination for you. Now, if you use the mask, what it means is that it will block um, the droplets from getting into you. Now, I've seen people put their marks around their chin. It's, it's not a good thing because the point is that if you have the, the marks here and then you get to start to somebody and the person speaks and then the droplets fall on your chin and then you drop the marks to your chin. What it means is that the mask collects the droplets and then once you put it back, you get the, 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 the virus. So in as much as possible, make sure that you are using the max properly. And, and then also, if you can, avoid large gatherings. If, if you can, avoid large gatherings. Because the more that you interact with people physically, 
the more that you are exposing yourself. Now, if you have to go to church, make sure that your church has enough or adequate hygiene protocols in terms of the cleaning. If you can, stay at home and, and, and watch the service from your house. It, 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 it's safer that way. And then also, um, indoors, indoor gathering, if you can also avoid that, that's also important because the reason being that if you are inside, the, the air circulation is reduced. So what it means is that if you get closer to somebody and then the person has the virus, the person is more likely to spread the virus indoors than outdoors. Outdoors, you have a lot of air circulation, so the air is able to dilute or carry the droplets away, so you might not get the virus. But in as much as you can, avoid um, large gatherings, wash your hands with soap, and running water for at least 20 seconds is really important. Physical distancing is important. Use the max as, as often as you can. You also need to very, take good, very good care of yourself. So what is happening is that because of COVID, people are losing their jobs and you are, you, you, you are thinking you can get stressed up easily, you can get fatigued. You need to take care of yourself. You need to think about your health as well. You should also develop alternative plans. Because in terms of like savings, HP or investing or whatever, now it's not even um, so adversable to invest because even those companies are also losing. So what is important for you is to also add, develop alternative plans. If you lose your job, what are you going to do? So you need to be thinking of emergency funds. You should also try as much as possible to listen to your local authorities. You know, the local authorities have guidelines that are um, effective for the area in which you live in. So you, you don't really have to watch what the Americans are doing and then you want to apply that. Though it might work in certain situations, but then the dynamics in an area is different from the dynamics in another area. So and as much as possible, you listen to your local authorities. Now, if I want to talk about let's say the safety protocols for let's say employers maybe you have employees and one you need to um try as much as possible and rotate your staff like you rotate them such so that you don't have large um, number of people coming to the office at the same time two you can also cut off some portions of your operations you only you can if you can you keep only the essential aspect of your business running so that you don't have to get in a lot of more, lot more people coming in to work. You can also switch to um, other means of operation. If like, let's say for instance, your customers will have to come into your workplace to be able to deal with them. Is there a way that you can reach them at home if you have to use um, the postal service or the courier service to get them? You can also do that. You need to be aware also, uh, the awareness is really important to create awareness as much as you can. And then you should also create emergency response and procedures because mostly when it comes to safety, people think about safety as a secondary issue. But now that um, the pandemic is here, you should, if you are an employer, you should be thinking about um, emergency response in terms of like somebody um, getting infected at the workplace, what do you do immediately? Um, you, you get notice of that, you should also be thinking about the mental health of your workers. Um, if they have somebody at home that has the virus, that person will not be in the right shape of mind when a person comes to work. So you should be looking at um, whether you're going to get them access to counseling or you're going to get them opportunities that will reduce the mental um, um, pressure that they're going to have. You can also do cross training of your staff. Um, because if, let's say, for instance, somebody does a job and then the person gets sick, what happens? So you cross-train such that if somebody falls sick, you'll be able to get in somebody else to help you um, do the job the way you're supposed to do. And then you have to step up your cleaning and hygiene protocols. It's really important you clean, 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 and make sure the hygiene um, is, is up there. And then you can also... Um, look at reorganization of the system uh, arrangement in your company. You can, if you can, you, are, you can create the opportunity that 
um, workers will be able to social uh, physical distance at a workplace, or you can install barriers. You can have glass barriers or maybe plastic barriers that uh, when people talk, um, it will be able to block um, the spread of the, of the droplets. And then also you, you, should, you should try as much as possible to, to help your, your employers, your employees understand um, the new um, normal that we find ourselves in terms of um, if it becomes necessary for them to maybe take a pay cut or maybe they have to take their vacation earlier than normal, you have to explain to them why it's so and um, the alternatives that you want to provide um, for them. So in summary, these are some of the few things that you can do personally and what you can do if you are an employer. Okay, thank you very much. We have a lot of questions coming in with regards to COVID-19. If you see me looking down, it means I'm looking at my phone trying to uh, gather questions that are being asked okay. on Facebook and being said to me. So one wants to know, how can we address outrageous costs on PPEs being used against COVID-19? Example, expensive sanitizers, expensive nose masks, and et cetera. Um, it's, it's rather unfortunate um, people are taking advantage of the situation to make excessive profits. Now, what I know some local authorities have done here in Canada is that if a company or a, a shop is found to be um, increasing the prices of goods, what they, they done, like they've been penalized for that because it, um, now it's become an essential good. So it, it doesn't really make that sense for people to just increase and take advantage of people. So what um, a, individuals, you don't really have much um, power when it comes to this, but then you can pressurize your MP, your assembly member, or any person that represents you to push government to be able to come up with procedures to make sure that any person that is caught um, exorbitantly taking money from people in terms of um, increasing prices for these PPEs, that person could be punished. So um, you can you can put pressure on your MPs. You can take it from there because as an individual, there is nothing you can do in terms of maybe forcing the shops to charge um, the prices they are supposed to charge. But what you can do is to put pressure on your reps or your representatives, and then they can put pressure on the local government authorities for them to push the shops or the stores to be able to charge um, normal fees. Mm -hmm. Those are some of the things that you can also do. Okay, thank you. So that's another question. Are there any side effects of using the mask or those are just rumors? Um, you know, like there's been a lot of tests to show that it doesn't really kind of like impact on your health. But then, you know, you see, we have different situations. So if like, let's say for instance, you know your risk, your risk level, and then you know that you need a lot of fresh air to be able to um, breathe. What I will do is that I would avoid a lot of um, outings. I'll, I'll stay home and not use the mask. But then if you can't physical distance in a situation, then you have to use the mask. So as I mentioned earlier on, you have to know your risk factor. And based on that, you design ways that yeah, um, if you, you, because sometimes I find the marks, uh, when I use the mask, sometimes it's, it's a bit um, uncomfortable for me. So what I do is that um, I, I, I rarely go out and you can see I have my, my hair, I've, I've not been to the barber shop for a very long time because I don't want to go to the shop and then use the mask and then feel a lot of comfort. So I chose to keep my hair on. So you have to design your own um, ways that work best for you. But for the max, so far there's not been any concrete research that shows that it makes uh, issues poses some health um, risks. But if it doesn't really work for you, then stay home, don't go out. If, if you have to go out, try as much as possible to physical distance. If it doesn't work for you, stay home. On the mask, 
someone is asking, I also hear the mask is not 100% safe because it doesn't protect your eyes. So what safety precautions can we take to protect our eyes when we social distance? Since we are not supposed to touch our mouth, our nose, and our eyes. Um, you, 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 you've noticed that um, some people use the, the shield. So if you can afford, you don't use, don't use the shield without a mask. So you can use the, the mask and then you use the shield or you can get um, goggles, you can wear spectacles or something like that. That should be able to protect your, your eyes. So if it's becoming too complex for you, stay home. That is, that is, that is the, 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 the safest actually. And, and if it becomes necessary for you to, to go out, then you have to, in as much as possible, uh, put on all the protocols that, because for me, for instance, if I'm going out, for instance, I, I carry a, a, a box of um, Lysol wipes, I have sanitizer, and I have the mask as well. So if I touch something, I wipe my hands with the wipes. If I'm not able to use the wipes, I use the sanitizer before I even touch the doorknob um, on, on, on my car, I wipe it before. So like. Everything that I touch, I wipe my hands because the point is that you are not even able to tell how people you ask them how did you get an infection. They say they don't know. So for me, anything that is new, like let's say for instance, I go somewhere and then I touch something, immediately after touching the thing, I, I wipe my hands. So I always have the wipe one in my after wiping, I throw it away. So you, you have to kind of like take all the precautions that you can. Like let's say for instance, even when we buy stuff from the grocery shop, what we do is that when I, I, we have, I am the only person in the house that goes out now because we feel that's what will work for us. So if I go out and I come, I stay in the garage, wipe my hands, wipe my trousers, wipe everything before I come in. Once I come in, we leave the items out for a long time. And then once the kids go to bed, my wife and myself, we wipe every item that we bought with wipes before we put them in there. If we get letters, we don't touch them for about two, three days because we don't know where the, the, the mail had gone to before coming to our house. So we put it in the basement for two, three days, nobody touches them. And then even when we are, about to open them, we wipe them before we, we, we type them. So you need to take all the precautions that you can because you don't really know how this virus is, is, is behaving. So the best you can do is to take your own safety into your own hands and make sure that you are taking all the good care of yourself that is necessary. Okay, so we have the last question and the question is, is hand gloves needed? or we don't need it? Um, it depends on your situation. Like let's say for instance, if you are going out and you're going to touch a lot of stuff, you need a, the, the, hand, the, the, the hand gloves. You know, you know why? Because it, you know, the virus can get into maybe the under your nails or something. So if you have the gloves, you wear them, and then once you are leaving, you just remove them and then you throw them away. If it doesn't work for you that way. Like myself, I use the wipes all the time. I use wipes all the time. So look, what is important is what works best for you. But then the point is that if, let's say for instance, you are touching a lot of things that would end up getting to your mouth, right? You need a gloves. So like, let's say for instance, you go to um, the bank and then you see the bankers wearing gloves, all right, and then they at the same time touching their phones with the gloves. So what you are doing is that though you are wearing the gloves, you are contaminating your phone. So you take the gloves or you touch your phone, you've contaminated yourself. So you really need to understand that this is really complex and then you need to have a procedure that is so simple that will work for you. So for me, because I don't want to forget anything, so I use the wipe. So anytime I touch something and I'm supposed to touch another thing, I wipe my hands. So you, the gloves are needed, but then you need to look at because if you are buying the gloves, means you are going to buy a lot of gloves. So that is also going to be money out of your pocket. Mind you, 
we are in a situation where you need to save money as, as, as well because you don't really know what is going to happen. So in as much as possible, you will limit how much money that is leaving your pocket now and um, do processes or things that will really um, decrease how much you are spending in terms of buying all the DPEs. Okay, thank you very much. So if I'm hearing correctly, we need to always prepare probably a safety kit when we move to be able to make sure that we are keeping ourselves, uh, uh, we are protecting ourselves. So there is another question, but then it has, it's, it's nothing to do with COVID. It's going back all the way to your journey when you came here. Someone wants to know, um, well, the questions keep coming. I think there's another question. Okay. That wasn't a question. So uh, there, there's a question up from when your, your journey and someone wants to know how long did, does it take to be certified as a safety professional here in Calgary or in Canada? So how long does it take and what, what process do you need to go through? I know you did mention, but probably the person just joined and wants to know. So that probably will be the last question. Uh, yeah, they, they, they are different pathways. Um, fortunately now, if you, if you come in with a, with a, with a, a bachelor's degree, um, you are likely to get certified as, as soon as possible. Because when I was applying, um, that process wasn't there. Though I had a master's degree, um, they said I needed Canadian work experience. But then for now, what they have now is, um, is, is if you have a bachelor's degree, you can, you can get um, the process going. So it can take as short as um, one year. It can take as short as six months. It depends on how you are able to get your application in. But um, the process is now shortened. So if you have a bachelor's degree before coming to Canada, you should be able to get your certification within the shortest possible time, especially if you are able to um, study. Because what is important is the study because uh, yeah, the that is where the, 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 the issue is. But now, if you have a bachelor's degree, you should be able to get certified within the shortest possible time. So any bachelor's degree or a bachelor's degree in safety? Um, they, they actually changed it. They made it um, the bachelor's degree. So if the bachelor's degree with some work experience, so if you have bachelor's degree in any um, area, you actually need some experience with safety to be able to, because the question is biased towards um, safety. So if um, you, 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 you get in with, uh, uh, you, 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 are, you are kind of like um, certified to be able to write the exams. You, you, you need that experience to understand what the safety is all about to be able to pass the exams. If you have no understanding of what safety is about, I doubt if you'll be able to pass the exams. So though you might be able to go through the process and get um, kind of like um, approved to write exams, you need some understanding of what safety is all about to be able to pass the exams. Okay, thank you very much. On behalf of everyone, at African Connect, we just want to say a very big thank you for honoring our, our invitation, for coming here and sharing all your knowledge with us. We are very grateful. Thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us and we appreciate it. So our next um, monthly meeting will be on the 29th of August and next month we are going to have our in-house certified immigration consultants. So all of you have been inboxing me about wanting to immigrate to Canada. This is your month. Come with all the questions that you have. We will have our, our in-house certified, certified immigration consultant talk to us about the different pathways you can use to immigrate to Canada. If you want to come in school here next month, the 29th of August, 1 p.m. Mountain Time is your time. Come Facebook Live or register to be part of our Zoom. Bring all your questions and ask him all your questions. Questions surrounding immigration during this COVID period, because I know people are still coming in. And so maybe if you have questions, if you want to come as a visitor, if you want to come as a student, if you come, want to come on a work permit, if you want to immigrate and come and land and get your permanent resident, bring all your questions and he will be able to answer it for you. Also, we need, we are still asking for volunteers. And if you're interested to volunteer for us, 
please send an email to volunteers for African connect at gmail.com volunteers for African connect at gmail.com we are also giving out COVID relief we know that some of you have already sent emails and we've put you in the list and we are giving out COVID relief if you fall into this any of these categories if you're a senior if you're a single parent if you are a newly landed immigrant and you did not qualify for SEP, if you are uh, an international student, or if you have COVID-19 and you are self-isolating, and you are an African and you live in Calgary, and you belong to any of those five categories, please send an email to africanconnect20 at gmail.com. Africanconnect20 at gmail.com, and we will attend to you. We are giving COVID relief supplies to Africans living in Calgary. So please, if you are part of this group, just send an email to africanconnect20 at gmail.com and we'll attend to you. Thank you very much for joining us this month. We really appreciate you. See you on the 29th of August at 1 p.m. Mountain Time. Bye-bye.